Okay, thank you very much. I'm not going to take very much of your time. So be it as so it is. <laughs> Anyone else having anyone else having announcements? All right, Dr. B. <coughs> yes, I was right on time. How's everybody doing? Right. Y'all know they kicked the uh, vibe off the show. Sinbad's gone. What? What? Show's canceled. Over. It's over. I was there, I know. Everybody's very depressed. And they got the new show, Magic. They have that Magic now. But Magic show's terrible, I got to tell you. And he tried to go with this Rainbow Coalition thing. They got one of, I've been there. Everybody works there. They try to make it where everyone's welcome. I want to thank him for that impassioned plea for the Bird family and also for all the work that Jamal has been doing for us for a long time. You know, Jamal doesn't make a whole lot of money. You know, last night, Brother Keedy <laughs> told everybody about my plight, but just, Jamal is mostly doing this because he wants to do it Absolutely. and because he believes that it's important. You know, there's that old expression in Egypt, and I use it frequently, Brother Charlie likes to quote me on it. <laughs> that ignorance is evil, ignorance is evil. Because with now in, in this country, the opposite of that is the case. They say that ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is happiness, ignorance is joy. I love to be ignorant. Because with knowledge comes responsibility. But once you get an inkling of some of this, you always have to probe your conscience and say, I know better. And therefore, I cannot pretend that the problems that we are addressing do not exist and not do anything about it. And I don't just come to the talking drum forum every Friday night and testify, and in the other six weeks, do little or nothing. Before I go any further, it's traditional to ask an elder for permission to speak. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the elders tonight and request your collective permission to begin the formal phase of the program. Do I have your permission? Thank you. Uh, before we go any further, I'm in a good mood and I'm in a very relaxed mood. I don't think I'm going to do too much hollering tonight, uh, but I do plan to give a very informative presentation that hopefully you will enjoy. But before I do that, um, two or three things before we get into the heart of the program. I was in Oakland last week, and uh, there's some brothers up there, that are brothers and sisters, uh, who have a program called well, I don't know the name of the organization, but it's basically, there are two flyers, I'm going to pass these out, and Charlie will help me. One is called Save Nubia from a Cultural and Heritage Cleanse Cleansing, and the other is called Appeal to Save Nubia. Perhaps I can get somebody else? Please. All right. It's nice to have volunteers like that. Hey. So let me read one of these flyers, because I haven't read it myself. Y'all know what Nubia is, right? Yeah. Nubia is southern Egypt and northern Sudan. And a lot of people believe that ancient Kemetic civilization or culture was developed by people that today are identified as Nubians. On the yellow flyer, it says, uh, from, save Nubia from a cultural and heritage cleansing and appeal to the free world. <laughs> yeah, that's... The automatic puts everything in doubt, doesn't it? I wonder who they're addressing. I guess that's us. For nearly a century, Nubians have been subjected to hardship and insecurity by the inundation of their villages and towns and their historical and archaeological sites. The systematic procedure to abolish Nubia and the Nubian civilization should be dealt with seriously. The Nubians, one of the greatest African civilizations, had contributed to the formation of humanity, and now they must employ the free world, employ the free world to contribute and save their endangered culture and heritage. The Nubian exodus of 1960 was the climax of all Nubian sufferings. The consequences were tragic as they lost a precious part of their homeland, rich with world and human civilization, monuments and remains. Now another part of Nubia, I hope y'all are following me now, this is important. With the wealth of monuments that have attributed to Nubian and world civilization is the subject of abolishing by inundating. 
The proposed Kashbar Dam waters will wipe out all of these monuments, all of them. Doesn't say a few. Surely there are numerous ways to provide power and develop the Nubian province without submerging any more of its land. Please help the general Nubians in pro protesting the construction of this dam by participating in a letter writing campaign to the following. And the other, briefly, the Sudanese government has, this is the most important one, I should have read this first. The Sudanese government has contracted out the Chinese government to construct a dam known as the Kajbar Dam Project for the purpose of bringing hydroelectric power to the Nubian area of Mahas. If this project is implemented, the flooding waters of the dam will submerge the most densely populated area of the Nubian Mahas, which is considered the richest in archaeological sites and monuments. In spite of proven alternative energy sources that could prevent this catastrophe and genocide, and regardless of the repercussions involved with the building of this dam, the Sudanese, Sudanese government is proceeding with business as usual. So here you can fill this out if you're interested. And there's a lot of email stuff on here and websites to follow. This is very important, and we can't allow these things to just happen without our intervention. This is as important as the James Byrd thing, because we need to be involved in things uh, like this all over the world. Now, one of the problems with this is, and again, I'm just reading this, is that some Muslims, uh, we're going to start controversy, Kitty, already. Some Muslims believe that nothing is really important before the time of the Prophet Muhammad. And so that anything that happened before that is known as the age of ignorance. So that if you go to Egypt today, and I've had the opportunity to go there five times now, and hopefully go back again in a couple months, including Nubia, you will see these Arabs exploiting Africa and antiquity. They'll sell anything. It doesn't belong to them. And they see that it really has no relevance because it's before the time of the prophet. That's the kind of ignorance that we're dealing with. Now, brothers and sisters, uh, tonight's presentation is called Looking at India Through African Eyes. And I would imagine <clears throat> a lot of you, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, can, I, can I get that drink down? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think a lot of people, um, <clears throat> heard one of the radio programs, <clears throat> excuse me, on either KJLH on uh, Wednesday morning, and thanks again to Jamal for hooking that up, or uh, Intervisions on Tuesday night. Now, I just got to town Monday afternoon, and Monday I had a free day with my family. You always got to do that. And then on Tuesday, <laughs> I stayed up, didn't take a nap, to do the interview at 11 o'clock. And then I didn't have an alarm clock. You know, I'm in my mother's house, and they go to bed like at 9 o'clock. Right? Everything is quiet. I'm lonely over there, y'all, just to let you know. And so I decided that instead of going to sleep and taking a chance of oversleeping, I would stay up for the other interview at 4.30 in the morning. And I still don't know how Jamal and Carl do that so consistently, 4.30 in the morning. But there were all kinds of sounds going on in the studio that morning. So maybe y'all aren't as smooth as I thought. I mean, in no disrespect. And then I was groggy and sleepy, so I don't hardly remember what I said. Ojo gave me a tape so I get a chance to listen to it. But basically tonight, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is to divide this talk up into, I think, five parts. Now, the first part, the biggest part, will be an overview of my recent trip to India. I was in India, I'm happy to say, from March 31st to April 21st, by myself, 21 days on the other side of the world, with most people who have never seen a black person from outside India before, brothers and sisters, who spoke several different languages, none of which I understood. <laughs> And the person who was supposed to escort me after two days said he had to go to another part of the country, but he was sure I would be okay. So, so I'm going to tell you about that. And then I'm going to show you some slides. Some of you have been following me for years, and you will have seen some of these slides, but I would imagine some of you too, and it's refreshing to see new people, uh, will be seeing them for the first time. And there'll be slides from um, 
work I've been doing on the African presence in India for since 1980, as well as a few new ones um, from, the, from the trip. And then I'm doing, one of the reasons I went over there, in fact, perhaps the major reason, is to um, set the tone and to iron out the rough edges for an African-centered tour of India that will take place in March 1999. It'll be the first one. And naturally, my ego insists that I be the one to coordinate that trip. Okay, I'm going to do that. So that's next March, and I'm going to tell you about that. And hopefully even some people will be able to go. And then we'll have a discussion period. If we have the time, I'd like to know what you think about all this information. Now, India is obviously very important to me because it has the largest concentration of black people in any one country in the world. But I want to know, if, are we connecting there? Do you see, see the significance of that? When I first started to do this presentation, way back around 1980 or 81, no, a little earlier than that, about 1983, a sister uh, angrily said, don't we have enough problems over here? Why do you want to be looking at black people in India? Okay? So we'll talk about that. And then the last bit of business, you got the flyers. I hope you'll respond. But of course, we have to do something to uh, finance this because we are working for each other. So let me tell you what we have tonight. Now, Brother Kiti Obi Owadu, who is a remarkable young man, he's a couple years younger than me, so I call him a young man. Uh, I did this presentation, very similar to what I'm going to do in a few minutes, at the African Cultural Center in Long Beach last night. I think Charlie was there, Chiquetta was there, Kitty was there. Anybody else there? Oh, wow. Dedicated souls. Thank you, Sister Margo. I didn't recognize her. Um, and this is a presentation in this tape right here. Now, Kitty, they just taped the thing last night. I didn't get in until about midnight. And here I am. He comes to me with a bag, with the videotape, labeled Renoko Rashidi, the only flaws in it, Renoko is spelled with one wrong letter. <laughs> Renoko Rashidi, Af Dollar to Black Untouchables of India, African Cultural Center of Long Beach. And this is a cover. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Isn't that excellent work? <laughs> so I'm very grateful to you, Kitty. I don't know where you are. There you go, brother. Give him a round of applause one more time. Things. Now, one of the things I like about it is because it corresponds to this book that I'm promoting. You see? Now, that's excellent. It really is good work. So, the tape is $20, only 20 bucks. And slides and everything basically I'm going to do tonight. So, if you have to run out or something, or if you want to get the tape that I'm doing this evening, you can take it with you. We do have a few of these, and only five of these books. Okay? And then, from India itself, are two lecture presentations, one in a uh, city called Nagpur, in the center of the country, and another in a place called Trivandrum, where I was with the Kerala Dalit Panthers, who named themselves as the Black Panther Party, and one last presentation called Great African Historians that I did in New York with Dr. John Henry Clark just in March. Anyway, that's the business. Now, book is 10, these are 20, and these are $5. And last but not least, we have the distinguished editor who is also my dear friend, Jaquetta Parham, A Rhythm of the Drum. And this is one other thing you can pick up if you like. You see the photograph right here? The sister is fine, isn't she? Beautiful. Yeah. She's a black woman from South Central India. Okay, And this is a photograph that I, yeah, South Central, I always got to be. And uh, always, man. And I, this is how I felt when I was over there, too. Um, this is one of the photographs I collected when I was a student at UCLA in 1980. And it's in this uh, article here called The African Presence in India, A Historical Overview. And this is basically what I'm going to talk about tonight. So if you want to purchase one of these, these are only $3. I think that's almost like giving it away. You can frame the photographs. It's very nice. And again, I used to be like Jamal. I used to have problems you know, promoting these things, but I don't anymore. Because if we are going to change the world, we got to finance it. And if we don't, somebody else is going to subvert it. And you can't get away from it. All right. All right. Now, what's all this about? I threw your magazine over there. I was... <laughs> um, March 31st, I went to India. Mm. And this is a trip that I have been dreaming about for some time. 
I developed an interest. Are y'all with me so far? Yeah. One last thing, give the good life. A good round of applause for letting us have this program. Um, I took an interest in India way back about 1977. Actually, before that. And uh, I met Legrand Clay. And before that, I had been reading um, Destruction of Civilizations by Chance Williams in particular. And the thing that the young brother, Legrand, had, and the old brother, Dr. James, had, for some reason, we never called George uh, Chance, I'm sorry, we very rarely called Chance Williams Dr. Williams. But he's Dr. Williams, Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben. But uh, Chance Williams, Dr. Williams, um, they talked about a time in history before the advent of the slave experience. It is all too often it is asserted that that is where our history begins, with Chicken George, on a slave ship, or in a jungle. And I certainly believe that. I went for it. I was just as brainwashed as anybody growing up. I went to school right here. I grew up in Los Angeles, went to Washington High School, and then I went to Cal State Northridge, and then I went to UCLA. And I grew up with a strong sense of inferiority. I grew up with a shackled mind. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, it's still there because we have to work on those shackles all the time. This is a deeply embedded process that we're going through. And it takes a while to rid ourselves of its impurities. And for me, I admit, it's a day-to-day -day struggle. And uh, Chance Williams would talk about black people in all over the world, Palestine, Mesopotamia, and India. And I never heard of anything like that. And then LeGrand, who was a dear friend of mine and the city attorney of Compton, and just an outstanding brother, and somebody I really learned a lot from, did a more comprehensive work. And finally, around 1980, um, Legrand, myself, Aza Hilliard, Richard King, uh, Nzinga, Heteru, we all formed an organization called Ementa. And it was a California-wide black think tank. And we were told, and I was about, uh, I guess in my late 20s at the time, I was full of energy, <laughs> full of enthusiasm. And uh, I was told that everybody in the group would have to take a special area and focus on that and become an expert in it. So uh, I was collecting information about black people all over the world, particularly in parts of the world about which we didn't know a whole lot, like Australia and the islands of the South Pacific. So the brand says, well, Renoko, you're going to have to have a focus. What, are you, what is it going to be? And I said, well, maybe, uh, India, why not that? He said, why India? He says, I said, because first of all, I've been collecting these pictures like that. I mean, it's blowing everybody's mind. I mean, look at that sister right there. And I hadn't seen anybody really do anything on it comprehensively. There have been people who wrote a chapter about it here or there, but no book. And so I decided that I wanted to be the first person to write a comprehensive book on the black presence in India. And I wanted it to be very similar to Chancellor Williams' book, Destruction of Black Civilization, because that book changed my whole life. You know, bold, powerful, sweeping work. And I wanted to do something on India. So I began to research it. And then about 1985, I edited a book called The African Presence in Early Asia, first edition. And somebody that I had been in a political organization with 10 years prior to that took the book over to India and gave it to the author of this book, B.T. Rashekar. And Rashekar got very enthusiastic because I was writing about untouchability and caste. And he was an untouchable. He was working for the untouchables. And these are the people that now call themselves the Dalit. The term Dalit means crushed, broken, and oppressed. And that's a little better word than untouchable. So Rashekar wrote an enthusiastic letter to Ivan Van Sertima saying, who is this guy, Renoko Rashidi, and how can I get in contact with him? And Van Sertima forwarded the letter to me. I got excited and wrote Rashikar, and we've been tight ever since. So around 1987, I was beginning to be a bit more prosperous, and uh, I wanted to travel abroad. So I went to Brazil in February, and then in October, I went to India. And I went there not just to humbug and be a tourist, but I went there to meet with the untouchables, the Dalit, and not only that, but to participate in a historic conference called the first All India Dalit Writers Conference. <laughs> For the first time in history, literally history, Dalit writers, activists, poets, journalists, and what have you came together at this one spot, a place called Hyderabad, okay. Okay. to voice their grievances and to express solidarity. And I was a part of that. I inaugurated the conference and I gave <laughs> I think a very good speech, right? Naturally, probably a little prejudice. Just a little bit. 
And, um, and I had a big impact. I got marriage proposals. People were calling me or sending me letters saying, can you get my son in such and such a school? And this and that and the other. And most people had never met a black person from outside of India before. So I kept saying I was going to come back every year, every year, every year. And then I decided I was going to organize a tour. But that's not an easy thing either. Because for most people, they don't understand what the significance of India is. What's the deal? You meet Indians over here in this country, and they're just as racist as most white folks. They don't identify with us. They don't look like us. They exploit us. So you figure, what am I going to go over there for? And so finally, this year, I said, I'm going back to India. And if I have to go by myself, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to let anything stand in my way. So I decided to, tr to plan a trip after February, our month, Black History Month, you know, which is where I make the bulk of my income. And also, I wanted to plan it after the national elections in India. The elections, I think, were from the 1st of March to about the 14th of March. And during this time, you have a new political power, and unfortunately, a new political phenomenon on the scene, and that is called the BJP. The BJP is a right-wing Hindu fundamentalist party. It's as though uh, Ronald Reagan and Newt Gingrich were Hindus. <laughs> so that's an analogy. And um, very conservative, very racist. India is what some people call the original home of racism. A lot of people refer to Hinduism as sanctified racism. So what we're talking about is looking at India through African eyes from our own perspective. That's what it means to be African-centered, to view things through your own perspective and not other people's, in our own best interest. And so, the BJP won, and I, I came to India right after that, also after the ASCAC conference. I'm an active dues-paying member of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, and they had their 15th annual convention in New York City at City College of New York in, uh, I think, March. 13, 14, and 15. So after, the week after, two weeks after, I, I left. And uh, the last Friday in March, I was in the United States. Uh, I got a letter, I got a call from London from one of my publishers. And he said, um, after him and hawing, you know, and telling me he was calling to see how my latest book was coming along, uh, which I wasn't happy about because I ain't got but two royalty checks from this guy in two, five years. I wouldn't let him publish a postcard. Don't even know how he got my phone number. He called me back. This is from London now. And he proceeded to say, Renoko, the real reason I called is because I talked to a spiritual person, an elder. And during the course of the conversation, and this startled me. This is not what you want to hear when you get ready to go on a long trip. He said, um, all at once, we were talking. And the guy says, Rashidi, <laughs> do you know anyone named Rashidi? And the publisher says, yeah, I know somebody named Rashidi. His name is Renok Rashidi. He lives in the United States. Call him immediately and tell him he is in grave danger. And he must be very careful. Now, this is not what you want to hear when you're getting ready to go. By yourself to the other side of the world. Strange country. So I got malaria and stuff. I tried to get a shot for hepatitis A and typhus. I got these two onks. Uh, I got a, a necklace with Osiris on there. And I had a Buddha in my pocket, OK? And a friend of mine said, later for all that, what you need is a knife. That's what you need. But nothing was going to scare me. So I leave. I go through New York. And then I fly to London. And then I fly to Delhi. On to Delhi, then, as they say in the movies. And I flew over Iran and Turkey and Pakistan. And I get there late on the evening of March 31st, and the editor of, the, of a publication called Dollar Voice and the author of this book, Viti Rashekar, is there at Indira Gandhi Airport to meet me. Yeah, it was. I'd never been in Delhi before. So we stay in a youth hostel. You can count on Rashekar to find something cheap. Okay? We uh, stay, but it was clean, it was economical. No point wasting money. Right. Um, and this is right near the, um, all the embassies, the American embassy, Norway, Sudan, China, and what have you. And the next morning, we toured all these areas, and we had breakfast with uh, a dollar who was actually a cabinet member. His name is Dalit Azimile, and he stopped everything he was doing. He spent about three hours with me, welcoming me to the country. After that, I'm just going to give you the highlights of the trip, because believe me, I could talk till next March about what happened. Wow. It was a trip of a lifetime. And I want you 
to come back with me next year. Now, uh, met with a lady who was a Sikh. When you see a Sikh man, these are the people with the turbans, and usually long beards. they're usually pretty big. And if you go to India, they dominate the taxi industry, and they're also dominant in the military. And had a wonderful lunch with her, and then purchased a ticket and flew east to the state of Bihar. When I made plans to go on the trip, I told Rashika, look, man, I'm counting on you to develop my itinerary. I want to go to Bihar in the far northeast, and I want to go to Kerala in the far southwest, opposite ends of the country. I want to go to Taj Mahal. I want to go to some other temples, and I want to go into some villages. And I said, other than that, you can plan anything you want for me. So he planned a meeting for me with all the subscribers to this publication, a publication called Dollar Voice. I'm the United States representative of Dollar Voice, okay? the voice of the persecuted nationalities denied human rights. And uh, so he planned a meeting for everybody who read Dollar Voice to come to this city called Nagpur, which is in the very heart of India, a historic city, ancient city, dominated by orange groves. And by the way, Nagpur is where this incident took place where his sister's husband was murdered. I went to the exact spot. And uh, so there we go. So we're in Patna. We stop off in, from Delhi in a place called Lucknow. Lucknow is the capital of a, of a state called Uttar Pradesh. And uh, you can look out in the skylines and you can see the Himalaya mountains. Oh, they call them the Himalayas there. And finally we get in Patna. And it's just like partner, but if you were speaking Ibanis, it's partner. Huh? And partner is the capital of Bihar. It's about 600,000 people. And the moment we got there, I said, boy, I know I'm in it now. Because Rashikar told me this is the real India. You could look out, and you can see, and you could smell the fires from people's uh, homes. They're heating their houses and cooking their food. And they use charcoal and wood. In the big cities, you don't find that happening. No lighting, and this is the capital of the state. There are no taxis at the airport. All they have were rickshaws and private cars. And rickshaw is about as big as this right here. That's, you fit about this many people in, and we got luggage and stuff. So we check into a hotel, and I have brought over there with me a fifth of vodka to help ease my nerves. And also, I knew that Rashikar was a bit of a drinking man, so I figured we'd sit up all night and talk. And Rashika would take a little drink, and he said, well, I'll see you in the morning, basically, okay? So the next morning, and it turned out to be good, because the trip is about to get full. The next morning, there's a delegation to meet me. There's a delegation of Muslims, there's a delegation of Buddhists, there's a delegation of Hindus, and there's a delegation of people that are called tribals. This is a tribal person. And these are the clearest example of what the first people in India look like. And in India, you have three components of black people historically. One, the first people over there are black, Africans. And then number two, you have those who developed the civilization. They're also the same thing. And then you have those of us who, like many other parts of the world, like us, were caught up in the slave experience and came to India voluntarily. Slaves didn't come from Africa. You know the rest. Africans were captured in Africa and enslaved and taken all over the world. If you look at those three things, that's what counts with diffusion or the dispersal what some people refer to as the diaspora of black people all over the world. India has all of those. And they were all there in that room to meet me. And they were delighted. They were probably more excited about meeting me than I was about meeting them. Because few people over there, even the educated elite, have ever met a black person from outside India. Nobody that I met had had any interaction with one. And for the most part, most people had never even seen one not even on television. Now, there are a lot of black people even in North India. So how, and I always ask this question when I travel abroad, could they distinguish me from them? First of all, the hair. They didn't have straight to wavy hair. And it's not always black. Sometimes it's reddish and blonde, natural. And then I figured the other part must have been the, the wristwatch, you know, the bracelet, the sneakers, the jeans, all of those things set me apart. And so from the very beginning, I was a real 
curiosity piece. I was interviewed, I think, in that city alone by three or four newspapers. And I was taken all over the city. The first uh, day, we went to uh, visit the Ganges River. But more important than that, on the following day, I had a chance to tour the slum areas of Patna. And this is where the untouchables live. And just to review quickly, the untouchables are those, not all the untouchables are black. And I don't want to mislead you. But most of them are. The untouchables are largely the people who built the early civilization of India and whose descendants were ultimately defeated by the Aryans, the white people, the Indo-Europeans. That's right. The first white folks to enter into India are called Aryans. The term Aryan is the epitome of white supremacy. Isn't it interesting that those animals that killed that brother in Jasper, Texas, and I live in San Antonio, which can't be that far, were members of the Aryan Brotherhood or the Aryan Nation. So when you hear that word Aryan, that's a buzzword for white supremacy. Right. The Nazis considered themselves Aryans. Right. So the Aryans, is the, the term Aryan is the name of the white people who invaded. They are truly barbarians. Right. Savages in the truest sense of the word. And I'm not here to bash white people. That's not necessary. <laughs> but I'm talking about savages. <laughs> Had never seen a city largely homosexual, women with few rights, children who are abandoned. They cremate the dead, but one thing about them, they are aggressive warriors, they're aggressive militarists. So they conquer all of northern India, and ultimately the whole of India, either physically or culturally, and impose a, a social order called Varna, V-A-R-N-A. -A. That, in their language, means color. And this is the system that today is known as the caste system. It is originally based on color. And the more white blood you had in, in you, the more advanced you were. So it would be an intermediate thing. White folks, what they call the intermixed people, and then the masses of black people who had been conquered. And then outside of them, the untouchables, who themselves were black, but who were even slaves of the slaves. And just to briefly uh, review, these people were not allowed to enter a village in the daytime. And it was thought that their shadows, the sounds of their voices, or their mere presence will cause pollution, ritual pollution, to other members of society. So they were kept on the lowest rungs of the social ladder. They were outside the social ladder. In fact, they're oftentimes called outcasts, which means outside the caste system, which basically means outside the realm of humanity. And in this state of Bihar, cows have a higher status. It's in, true now. Cows have a higher status than untouchables. And most of them are black. And most of them are poor. Bihar, I wanted to go to Bihar, kind of person I am, because I had always heard that Bihar was the most corrupt, backward, poorest, and oppressive part of India where the untouchables had it the worst. So naturally, that's where I wanted to go. And uh, they took me through these slums, and I went to three slum communities in the city. Lots of homeless people. The city is dirty, it stinks. You know, there are cows, there are water buffaloes, horses, chickens, donkeys, goats, and I was quite surprised to see, and dogs, of course, uh, I was quite surprised to see a lot of pigs, and the ugliest pigs you could ever imagine. I saw one at night, and I said, man, what is that? <laughs> right, so I said, that's a pig. And I said, well, should we go this way? And he said, no, he won't bother you. And I used to see you no know, pigs just wandering around at random, anywhere and everywhere, all over the city. And people are desperately poor. It is a decaying city. A very ancient city. So we toured the slums. Brothers and sisters, it was horrible. And that is too kind to work. I went in one area, uh, three consecutive slum areas, one morning. And plus it's hot. Close to 100 degrees, and it always makes a difference. People live tightly packed together. So you might have a hut with corrugated roofing or just thatch on top, maybe this big and the depth of maybe here, maybe slightly bigger, to the wall. And in that area, you might have six people living, and maybe a cow and a goat, all in there. Flies, mosquitoes. This one area held 2,000 people, and there was one well to service everybody. They did their washing, drinking water, you name it, cleaning. And I went over and took a picture of them, and it was filled with, you know, green slime and mold on the side for 2,000 people. Everybody's barefooted, snotty nose, 
hair on comb, spitting, defecating, urinating publicly. I saw one person, I said, how old is that person? He's the elder. I said, he, but what is he, about 70? So he's 35. So this is horrible. You know, they took me to what they called a school, and it's really just like a, a bench with a side of a shed that has thatch on top. No textbooks, no notebook paper, no ink pens, no pencils, none of that. So I walked all through this, and you know, nobody asked me for any money. Now, when you go to Egypt, bachish is a way of life. Begging is a way of life. People don't beg because they're hungry. It's cultural. Over there, in spite of everything that had happened to these people, I sense this time, more than ever before, that they still maintain their dignity. A lot of women have been forced to turn to prostitution, not to get crack cocaine, but to feed their family for one more day. So I asked the people that took me, I said, um, how are they viewed? Are uh, they looked down? And I said, no. These women are doing what they have to do, and people accept that. So I was impressed by that. And so I walked through this area, hot, sweltering, a whole crowd of people following me. Now, I was told, they were told that I was a journalist, a United States uh, African-American scholar <laughs> named Renoko Rashidi, who had gone over there, and that sounds kind of like a Muslim name. Rashid is Islamic, or Muslim. So I had one of the little caps on, because the people that took me there were Muslims. One day I'd be with the Muslims, <coughs> one day I'd be with the Buddhists, and then the Hindus every now and then. And every now and then a Christian would pop up, and then a tribal person would present himself from time to time. Now, the one tribal person that I met in Patna, and I don't remember his name, he was from a group called the Santal. Y'all still with me? Yeah. Um, he was the supervisor of police, because they have an affirmative action program over there, too, that the government is trying to dismantle, just like over here. And so um, he wanted, he wrote me, he wrote a letter to the police department so that I could have an armed escort all the time. So that no matter what happened, they were going to protect me. So most of the time I would go to a place and there'd be six or seven men around me. Some who would never literally take their eyes off me. And that can be unnerving too. <laughs> so we go in this area and finally, uh, it's hot now. And this is my first full day in Patna in Bihar, and uh, I'm ready to go. And they showed me the school, and they asked me to sit on this bench. And a whole group of people crowd around me, and it's kind of cute, you know, you like attention, it's not a bad thing all the time. And uh, one guy came up to me and started fanning me, and uh, he was the teacher. He had a salary of $2.50 a month. $2.50 a month. Tony Till, how about that? $2.50, my brother. And. Uh, so I said, man, can, you know, can I give you some money? I had to ask them. I said, I would like to donate, I'm not much, I'm $50 or something to the school. But for them, that's a phenomenal amount of money. You know, they gave me a receipt. They sat and wrote the receipt. I still have it. See, I wasn't used to anything like that. And then they asked me to take tea with them. Now, I have described the community. <laughs> and uh, my inclination was to say, you know, I'm really not thirsty. It's hot and it's too much, much too warm a day to be drinking tea. But brothers and sisters, these people have been told for the last 3,000 years that they are filth. And my attitude was, no matter what, I'm not going to reinforce that. I saw myself as a visiting ambassador Wonderful. who represented all of you and I was going to represent you well, and I'm fairly confident that for most of the trip, you'd be very proud of the brother. Wonder. I acquitted myself very well. So, I said, uh, all right, I'll, I'll have a cup. And they handed me the cup, and I didn't really want to look at it. And my attitude was, the water was boiled, so I guess it's okay. And I drank it, and they kept fanning me, and everybody's grinning at me and taking pictures. And uh, so I finished it and gave it back to him. So how about another cup? I said, okay, give me one. And I think I might have drank one more. So finally get out of there, and we walk to the edge of this slum area, and all these people are gathered around the Jeep. Now, I don't know what they're saying, but they're talking in a very animated fashion, so I just get in the Jeep. And I, I, I was washing my hands with this hand sanitizer, to tell you the truth. I don't want anybody to see me. Uh, so finally, after about 10 minutes, everybody crowded in, 
And they'll be riding like about eight or nine deep. <laughs> and uh, I said, what were they saying? He said, they're talking about you. I said, what were they saying? He said, man, they were trying to figure out who you are. <laughs> and I said, well, how did they act? He said, literally, they were astonished. And that's the word they use. And I said, what did you tell them? I said, if you were from America, I said, did they understand that? Not many of them. That most people don't even have a concept of what America is. India is composed largely of 800,000 villages. That's where the masses of people live, almost 950 million people. And probably that 950, probably 700 million live in villages. And some of them are very far removed. So I told him I wanted to go in villages, and he took me into plenty of them. And he said I was a hop sheep. He said they would never understand African American. But hop sheep, they understand. Hop sheep is a term for black people who were captured in Africa, enslaved, converted to Islam, and won their freedom and rose to very high positions. So Hapshis are like dignitaries. So I was a Hapshi. Then he took me to another area, and this is dominated by the lowest of the untouchables. See, there are even different categories of untouchables. These people are forced to attach a broom to their back to erase any evidence of their presence. And much in India today, Dalit women or untouchable women cannot clothe themselves from the waist up. It's not uncommon to uh, take a Dalit woman. There was a case where the sister in the north, the same state where they detonated the nuclear devices, um, sister's sons stole some vegetables. They're hungry. You should see some of these people, so malnourished. So they stole some vegetables. And so this lady was accosted, stripped, and beaten, paraded naked through the village at noon, and then made to have sex with her two sons in front of everybody. This is how our people are treated there. The first people. The descendants of the first people. The people who built civilization over there, this is how they dealt with. So the next group is an uh, area of people that called the Dom, D-O-M. And these were dark-skinned people with reddish uh, hair. And every now and then you find somebody with blonde hair. I had never seen anything like that except Australia, where I planned to go in November. And they were happy to see me, too, and I was a strange sight. Now, this area was even worse than the group prior. The first group is called the Metar, and I don't expect you to remember all these names, but I'll tell you anyway. And then you have the Dome, and I gave them a little money too, and then finally I was taken to another area, which was even worse than the first two. And finally I said, man, I had enough. <coughs> I walked past this one sister, she was sitting in a pile of garbage, sitting in it, and just a cloud of flies all over her. And she's picking through the garbage, looking for anything she could eat or use. And this is day-to-day -day reality. When you would leave these areas, you left, you left with a sense of relief, but also with kind of a sense of guilt. Like It was like you were leaving prison. But they didn't have a key to unlock the door. No schools, no sanitation. They had these latrines that were just backed up with feces for months. You can only imagine what it's like when it really gets hot or when it rains. Because there's no drainage system, there's no electricity, there's no lights, and these other two areas didn't have a school. So they walked me through this area, and then that was it for that day. I had two interviews with two big time newspapers, and I was just furious. And I was saying things like, how could the government allow this to happen? And they said, well, we're doing what we can. We're making great progress. And I would be just furious. And you, you can't eat or it's hard to eat after that. And really, brothers and sisters, you question your faith in God. There were times when I felt like I was just in a nightmare and I couldn't wake up. You want to cry, but tears wouldn't come. So that was that. The next day, it got worse. And we went to a village uh, in a district called the Jahanabad district. And once again, we, a bunch of us piled together. And they're just like us. We say we're going to leave at 8, and we leave about 11. And we drive all day. And then every few minutes, somebody has to stop and use the bathroom. So that was the way that trip was. And we go to this place called Jahanabad. Now, in, in December, 65 men, women, and children were murdered in Jahanabad. Late at night, about midnight, a private army of 300 gunmen came into this village and just shot anything and everything. I think they killed 26 children uh, under the age of 10. One a two-year-old, one six months old, one person 80 years old. They shot everything, mostly women and children. Now, the idea behind these things is to keep the dollars terrorized, keep them in a perpetual state of fear, go in and rape all the women, shoot the men. 
So, and then if you protest, who are you going to protest to? Because all the government officials, the head of the army, the head of the police, all the priests, the head of the universities, are all of the upper caste, and those are the ones who are ordering the killings. So they took me to this district, not to that specific village, but one very close to it, and these people were messed up. They were just like the dome, except they lived in the country. The dome are known as scavengers. They clean the trees with their hands. And I'm not talking about with gloves, with their hands. That's their job, they're scavengers. They take the filth and they put it in a bucket and then you put the bucket on top of your head and then you walk to the outskirts of the village and you dump it. And you can see the excrement streaming down the back. I mean, this is horrible. I called a group of them together to see if I could take a picture of them. And they ran. I pulled out my camera, they thought it was a gun, they thought I was going to shoot them. And it's, it's almost funny, but it's tragic. I talked to one sister, she had glaucoma, and last year she had had nine of her sons who were murdered by upper caste Hindus. And then one lady had two of her sons murdered. And naturally, what did I do? The American thing, can I give you some money? I had asked them, and they took it, and I finally got my pictures, and they walked me around. It was just pathetic. So we go back to Padna and spend one more evening with Rashid Kar. And we go to a restaurant, this little hotel, and uh, we both had, a, I think, a couple of beers. And we were all sitting around eating this restaurant. And Rashid Kar is very funny. He has quite a sense of humor. He's 63 years old. And I love to be around him. He's, I think if, if there is such a thing as reincarnation in a past life, he must have been a king because he just has a very regal bearing. And he likes me. Right? Uh, so we were sitting there talking and eating our food, and all of a sudden a rat ran right down through the middle of the restaurant. And Rashi Khan says, Renoko, did you see that rat? I said, no, where is it? And it's over there. And I said, man, if you see it again, let me know. So sure enough, a few minutes later, the rat came out again. But the rat wasn't moving, the rat was just chilling. He you know, wasn't moving fast, he wasn't worried. But you got that impression the rat was very secure. <laughs> because everybody was laughing. And so Rashi Khan says, I will not have this. You have rats here. You will not have me tomorrow. Oh, I was in stitches because nobody else seemed to even take notice of the rats. So the next day I checked out of the hotel. Somebody insisted that I stay in his house. A Muslim doctor named Dr. M. Ijaz Ali treated me like a prince. Never took a cent. And I said, look, man, I'm really comfortable in this hotel. It's all right. It's not bad. And I'm just cool. And so no, it won't do. You're too far away from us. We want people to have access to you 24 hours a day. And I said, well, all right, then. Let's go. So he says, I want you to stay in my house. But he doesn't even stay in the house. He got all these strange people. And I had a room, and they had to clean it up and spray for mosquitoes and close all the windows. And they had a separate room for a toilet and a shower. And I said, well, at least that's not bad. They had this... I don't know what you call these toilets where you have this container on top that holds the water and then you have a little hole, they call them squatters, literally a hole in the ground. And you pull the chain. And I said, well, I guess, you know, I, I guess I can deal with that. Well, I, can, I can do that. So I took care of my business. I'm down there squatting and I get up and I pull the chain and nothing happens. I said, wow, wouldn't well, you know it? Maybe it's out of water. Maybe I don't understand how to fill it up. So I started moving this thing around, and a big lizard about that big jumped out of my head. Either the lizard or Renoko was leaving the bathroom. So I mean, I would, from time to time, be in somebody's house, and I just see a lizard up on the side of the wall. And nobody's noticing, and I'm eating, and I'm looking at the lizard all at the same time. And you know, I'm not squeamish or anything, but I ain't crazy about lizards and, and snakes and when you can't see them. It kind of gives you the creeps. So we leave for a place in the south of Bihar called Bodhgaya. And before we get to Bodhgaya, we stop at a place called Nalanda. Nalanda is the site of an ancient Buddhist monastery and university. It covers 62 miles. Imagine that, a university covering 62 miles, all made of brick. And we stopped there and we walked over the ruins. And then we went to a place called Bodhgaya. Bodhgaya is important because this is the place where the Buddha is supposed to have received enlightenment. They actually have a branch 
of the original Bodhi tree. That's what the bookstore is named after. The Bodhi, they planted a branch, and now it's a big, massive tree. And they have a big temple there, built by a Buddhist king, and they have a black Buddha inside it. And that's why I took a picture of it. And I went and sat under the Bodhi tree, thinking that maybe the Buddha sat in this very spot. And I was ready to go after that. But the guy who I was with, a guy named Buddha Sharon Hans, uh, insisted that I meet the monks who were running this place, who themselves were untouchables, although they were Buddhists. So we chatted. They said, well, we're very familiar with your work. And I was shocked. And these guys were telling me they knew the name Renoka Rashi in that part of India. So it was an honor. But unfortunately, we talked too long, and we couldn't get back that night. You can't drive some places at night, because on the road, you have these big craters. You have donkeys, horses, cows, chickens, goats, water buffalo, buffalo, ox, people, motorcycles, motor scooters, little cars, big cars, and trucks, and there are no lights. So it was decided we can't go, we can't leave tonight, which is a disappointment to me because this was not the sort of place I wanted to stay. And we finally stayed in a place called a circuit house. In the outskirts of the city, you couldn't see anything. All you could hear was crickets, cricket. And, uh, mosquitoes just swarming all over you. So the guy says, are you going to be comfortable here? And I'm like, well, what else are we going to do? Are we going to sleep in the car? So they put me in a room with a big mosquito net and a big lizard on the wall. And ants all in the bathroom. But I'm saying, that's all right. I'm in India. This is what I paid my money for. I was ready for this. I'm a soldier in the army of African liberation and redemption. Nothing was going to turn me around. So, I'm getting ready to go to bed. I'm under the mosquito net, and I hear a big knock on the door. Now, who could this be? So, Budishar and Hans comes and says, Renoko, real stern. I said, I wonder what happened. You were cold a minute ago. He says, Renoko, under no circumstances are you to open this door for anyone. We leave at 5 a.m., and I don't care what they say, don't let anybody in this room. How do you think I slept that night? <laughs> I'm looking for somebody to break in. I got both eyes open. I couldn't wait to get out of there. Now, as it happened, when we got back to Padna the next morning, without a mishap, there's the physicians waiting for me. Renoka, where you been? He said, man, we went to Bogaya. We stayed overnight. He says, I'm ready to take you to a tribal area. I said, really? Now, this is like 350 kilometers away. These are the people I'm going to show you in the slides. Tribal people, black <coughs> people. And I never thought I would get a chance to go to one of these places in my lifetime. I said, we go in? He says, yeah, two hours. So we get a driver who drives literally like a demon. <laughs> foot all the way down. And every time, every now and then, I said, man, why don't you slow down? He would just. <laughs> like, who do you think you are telling me how to drive? I said, just go ahead. Do what you got to do. Nobody hardly speaks English. The doctor couldn't go with me. And I heard him say, before I left, he says, he is to experience no discomfort, pointing to me. <laughs> I said, how much is the chip going to cost? He said, 1,500 rupees. I offered him the money. He said, man, I wouldn't take any money from you. You're on tour. If you get a chance when you come back to the United States, send some for the school. Wonderful. I'm going to help build that school. Wonderful. We're going to help build that school. Right. So finally, after about eight hours, we get to the travel area. Now, we're supposed to have been there in three hours. <laughs> three hours passed. We ain't anywhere close. Well, how close are we? Another two hours. Two hours passed. Well, we should be there by now. Probably another two hours. Another hour passed. And where we at? Man, we're on the way. You want to stop for tea? You want a cold drink? You want to call? I said, man, I want to get to the tribal area. He said, what's tribal area? I said, the Munda. He said, you sure you don't want to go see the Santals? I said, the Munda. You mean the Orion. The Munda. So he said, okay, I'll get you there. How long is it going to take? About another two hours. Now, by this time, the sun is starting to set. And I don't want to get stuck out there. I don't want to be in another one of those circuit houses. So I'm looking at the sun like you do in a vampire movie when the sun is going down and you want to get in before Dracula starts to hang. So finally, I said, ancestors, 
<laughs> if you just let me see these people, I won't bother you for a long time. This is something I, I implore you, I must say. And you know, it seemed like the ancestors must have been with me on that trip. Because right after that, we found a village. And black people started streaming out of the village, poor, dirty, just like the dome, and just like the people in the village. But this is a tribal area called Hazari Bak. One brother came out of a hut with a monkey around his neck. I said, man, this is India. And they walked me all around, and they, some of them started crying. Not because they were overjoyed to see me. They weren't crying for tears, but they were crying of anger because they were showing me just how they had been abused and mistreated, how the women had been so sexually exploited. So these, I gave some more money to, and they didn't, they didn't resist at all. But they weren't begging, they weren't demanding. They accepted anything I gave them, and I gave all the children in the village just pencils. So I brought plenty of those, I learned that from Dr. Ben. So, that's the highlight of Bihar. The next day, I took a 28-hour train ride. It was miserable. To the center of the country. And you can see two things in particular. One is, you can look outside and see small shrines called satis, S-A-T-I. A sati is a woman who has committed suicide. She has set herself on fire in order to, and when your husband died, now this is a society where it's totally male-oriented. India is only one of two countries in the world where there are more men than women. Because if they fight, they will murder girl children in a minute. Or they will abort a girl child once they find out, oftentimes, if it's a female. It is said in India in ancient times that a female is never independent. When she is a child, she belongs to her father. And when she outlives her, uh, when she grows up, she belongs to her husband. And she outlives her husband, she belongs to her son. So she can't inherit any property. So committing the sati was an honorable thing to do. It was taught. And this is exploitation of women. Now they would have a funeral pyre and they put the body on it and uh, put flammable liquids on it, particularly a liquid called ghee, G-H-E-E. -E. And uh, the eldest son would take a torch and light the fire. Now when the fire, when the flame starts to burning high, it's the widow's function to jump on the flame, jump on the fire, and that way she continues to serve her husband. And she saves both souls in stuff for 35 million years. And she becomes a goddess. So all over the landscape, you can see these little shrines. It's a horrible exploitation of women. Sometimes children, they have these arranged marriages. And I read about a girl who was four years old who was married. I married a four-year-old child. Four women in India. So. Um, also, you find a, a tree called, a, they call it the flame of the forest. This is a beautiful tree, big tree, with bright orange leaves. Never seen anything like it, absolutely breathtaking. And finally get to a place called Jalkan, which was even uglier than Patna, but I couldn't wait to get off that train. I couldn't wait to get off the train. And we take a, a taxi and then a bus to a hotel near a place called Ajanta. Have you ever heard of Ajanta? Yeah. They have these magnificent caves there, temples. And uh, all hell broke loose. And the guy who was my escort had kept asking me for money. A Russian car had assured me that I told him, don't ask you for any money. And he was doing it anyway. And I said, okay, no problem. I need money for train tickets, this, that, and other. So finally, I gave him $200, American. I said, I got to go to the bank and exchange. He said, I'll do it for you. Don't worry about it. And I should have known by his enthusiasm that this was not going to work. So I'm hot and miserable. And he says, we're going to stay in this hotel today. And this is a hole in the wall, like a dollar a day. I said, man, I'm not staying there. And by the way, where's my money? And he says, what money? I said, the $200. He said, oh, you mean that $50? I said, no, the 200 He said, I forgot it. I said, man, how are you going to forget my money? I'm speaking of Bonnix now. <laughs> he said, I'll give it to you in the next city. I said, I want it this moment. So he starts going through his pocket, and he pulls out about 50. I said, man, and this isn't exactly what I said, but this is for the good life. I said, man, you better give it up. And he says, brother, you misunderstood. I will manage everything. I said, man, I don't want you to manage my money. I'm a grown man. Give me my money. And Jamal couldn't have done it no better. Give it up. And he says, I don't have it. So I called him everything that I could think of in English and a little bit of Hindi I knew. And I really wanted to hit this guy. I'm not a violent person, but I really wanted to strangle this dude. 
But I said, if I hit him, first of all, he'll probably hit me back. And I don't really want to deal with that. He's a pretty big guy. And more than that, I said, if I do that, and I really alienate this guy, then I'm really stuck. Here I am in the middle of nowhere. Nobody never seen another black person like me before. And I am, quote, unquote, in America. I a couple grand in my pocket, cashier's checks in, in cash. Nobody speaks the language. So I said, well, I just better, better deal with it. I learned that there are certain situations in there where you can't lose your head and just do something impulsive and let your temper carry you away. Then you get in trouble. So I went to this cave complex, and the cave naturally was closed where the temples were. So a guy talked me into climbing up a mountain to get to the water, to get to a waterfall. So naturally climbing up there, I fell in a stream. I'm soaking wet, and I came down on my wrist to break my fall. I had this big wristwatch on a thick band, and it literally exploded. That's the only thing that kept my arm from breaking, I'm sure. So I'm wet, I'm scratched up, my watch is gone, my money is gone, it's hot, the temple is closed, and to get to the top, the waterfall is dried up. So finally, I do get in the temple, I see the temple, and to make a long story short, I finally paid somebody about $120, $100, to drive me 500 kilometers away to a city called Nagpur. Now, I hoped that I would be able to find a hotel. I hoped these guys were going to drive me someplace and murder me. They could have easily have done it. And nobody would have ever known the story. It was, Jamal would say, what happened to Renoka? I heard he went to India. He never did get back, did he? We better do a lecture for the brother. So uh, I finally got there. And naturally, they wanted some more money. I just looked at them like, <laughs> and, the and the hotel had vacancies. This was a fabulous five-star hotel. They said, sir, we have plenty of vacancies. Here's my credit card. Show me a room. They showed me a room. I looked at the menu. It had chicken and fish. They even had Kentucky Fried Chicken on the menu. It was purely American. I said, this is the place for me. They had CNN, TNT. I started to even say BET, but they didn't have that. Then I would be lying. Turner Classic Movies. But I needed that at that time, just to regroup. So I stayed in this hotel, and I was taken while I was there to visit a criminal tribe. And they're called a criminal tribe because they uh, fought the British. And now they earn most of their money through distilling liquor. They're, they make moonshine. And they took me into their, their community. One lady took me into her house, me and the brother that took me there. And I was told she was the leader of the community. And while I came, while I was there, her husband came in. And I said, oh, you and your wife are the leaders of the community? He said, no, she is. In the tribal areas and among the dollars themselves, women are very important. And most of the time, they are in the leadership positions. And the men are very secure with that. In traditional Hindu society, the women are literally no thing. They, they don't have any status at all. And I spoke at the conference. The conference went well. About 150 people came from all over India to hear me speak. It was historic. Remember, the government came. And, um, but interestingly enough, there were only two women who were there. Two women delegates out of 150 people. I have the speech right here. You know, you ought to get it's $5. You get the whole thing. Why? Say it in America. If we had a program like this, it'd be at least half people would be women. What's up? And people would be quiet. People are taught just to be docile and to accept oppression. I went to where this lady's husband was murdered. And then nobody, now 100 people killed this day. Her husband was trampled to death, and there she is crying. And uh, no protest, no demonstration. They said, what do you do if that happened in America? I said, you know, there was a guy named Rodney King. And Rodney King had a trial. And his white folks set the people who beat him free. I said, they burn a whole city up. Think about that. Because these people have been taught to be docile, to accept oppression, because they believe that it's karma. Because of something that you did in a previous lifetime, you are born on this level today. Now, the idea is if you do your dharma, your caste duty, then in another lifetime, you will be born on a higher level. Now, for those that get out of line, you know, they have guns, prisons, what have you. 95% of the prison population in India are untouchables. 95%. AIDS is proliferating dramatically. And I know some people say there's an AIDS hoax. I haven't done the research, but I do. 
respect Brother Keating on that, but there was a, a report that came out in a newspaper that on, at one truck stop alone, one route, that 30,000 people had been tested for HIV. And of that 30,000, 27,000 tested positive. And the AIDS is being spread, or whatever it is, by young black women. Because black women over there, women are black women are fine everywhere, including right here tonight. But there they have these women who are just viciously exploited because of the poverty and the ignorance. So while I was at the thing, a tri another tribal brother met me. I met him. And his name is L.K. Madawi. I use a lot of their initials, L.K. Madawi. And um, he was what you call a gond. Gond. G-O-N-D. And he took me, he wanted to come and take me from the hotel to his little village. I said, all right, I'll go with you, no problem. Come through about noon tomorrow. So he comes and he's got this little bitty motor scooter. I said, man, I'm not riding on that. <laughs> he said, sure, brother, no goes, no price. I ain't riding on that. <laughs> Naturally, I rode on it. Okay. And he took me to his village, walked me all around, and then he took me to his house. He's a scholar, has all these books. And, uh, he, you know, his wife fed us, and, he started, and, his, and his daughter started playing some music. Now, what do you think they, they play? This song, I Got the Power. I couldn't believe it. They play R&B, black music in the middle of India. And the tribal people have a strong African country. I could not believe it. So finally that night, I, I was leaving the next morning, and I'm to check out the hotel. Give me my, my bill. And he gave me the bill. I said, you know, this is extremely reasonable. Only about $30 a night, food. And I said, this is great. You know, I could have stayed here a week. They said, but sir, we did not include your telephone bill. I said, well, I knew it was too good to be true. Give me that. They gave me a bill. It was over $600. The telephone bill for four nights. I made three calls to the United States and three calls inside India. I said, man, I'm not going to pay this. You got to be joking. I took the bill, balled it up, threw it right in his face. I wouldn't even do that in the United States. This is a hotel owned by these upcast seniors. I said, I'm not going to pay it. You can call the police. You can call the army. You can do anything. I am not going to pay this bill. You must be joking. I had no idea when I made those phone calls it was going to cost us when They said, well, sir, I assure you that in your room, there is a note saying what a phone call. I said, there ain't no note in my room. And I'm not going to pay it. So I ran up in my room, pissed off, and naturally I started packing my bags. And I'm thinking of what I'll do. <laughs> Just sneak out. It's not really, I was gonna sneak, sister. I was packing the bags and figuring out how I was gonna do this. Yeah, I had three suitcases, right? And I'm gonna sneak through the lobby. We got all these doormen and go to the airport and spend a night at the airport. And I said, you know, if I do that, even if I get out of here, they'll probably have the police waiting for me at the airport. Really? I said, I don't want to pay this money. I really don't want to pay it. And for the second time, I said, I wish I was back in the United States right now. That's a horrible thing to say. But when you get a present, and again, you buy yourself. You know, anybody to talk to, and you know they're screwing you. So finally, I said, okay, use my head. This government official gave me a thick package of, of, of stuff, photographs that had been taken of him, and newspaper articles written about him. He and I had posed for pictures, and what he was a member of the government, Minister of Health and Family Plan, big office. So I went downstairs with this portfolio and said, look, I'm an author. I came over here to write a book about the dollars and black people in America. I am a guest of the government. This man. And just as that happened, a newspaper reporter from the biggest newspaper in the city of Nagpur came to interview me. I'm just like the ancestors sitting. I said, look, man, these people are ripping me off. They want to make me pay this bill. I'm not going to pay it. I've been cheated. I've been abused. I'm a foreigner. I want you to write a column on the front page of tomorrow's paper. Now, by this time, everybody in the hotel is checking me out. And the manager is saying, sir, if you come, I don't want to come down. I'm not going to pay the bill. <laughs> sir, well, you can just come. I don't want to. I told you, I don't want to be gone. And I'm not going to pay. You can call the police if you want to. So naturally, they drastically reduced the bill. Okay. And I was able to get out of there. I fly south to a city. You know, I figured I might as well push it. And I wasn't, I was angry, but I was in control. But I wanted to let them know 
that I was a raving lunatic because they don't know anything about us. Really? So I figured I was going to push it to the max. And I gave them an idea as to what we are all about. Right. They don't take no crap like that. Come on. Now, I wouldn't do that in a hotel in the United States because they would call the police on you. In a minute, I'd be in jail. So I fly down south to a city called Trevandrum, city of a million people. And naturally, I'm flying by myself, and I get there, and there's nobody to meet me. Damn, man. You know, yeah, I came on with me, and this is how people going to treat me. So I get my luggage. Here's the ambassador now. And I walk outside the airport. And there's about 40 guys, all of them black, with their fists up in the air like that, with a television crew, and a big sign in black said, hearty welcome, Renoka Rashidi, African-American scholar and human rights activist. Oh, it was good. And I said, I'm finally at home. Because these people seemed like they were delighted to see me. They were members of the Kerala Dalit Panthers. They are named after the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, and they are black people. In northern India, I would see individual groups of black folks, or single black people. But they, obviously, there was no black consciousness. You would think if you go to another part of the world and you see somebody that looks like you, you're going to say, hey, brother, what's up? You're going to express some form of solidarity. But it wasn't like that. But in the South, these people were conscious. They had, this was the birthday. This is April 14th. The trip is two weeks old. I got one more week left. And it's the birthday of a man named B.R. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar is a great national leader of Dalit. He's the baddest Dalit ever. He's all our great leaders in rolled into one. And it's his birthday. So they're going to have a big uh, program, and I'm the keynote speaker, which, of course, was an honor. And I was met by the chairman of the Keller Dollar Panthers. His name is K, initial K, Ambu Jackson. Ambu Jackson is his name. So everybody call it Ambu for sure. Ambu Jackson, a black man. And the, you sisters would love this brother. And, you know, he's very black, and he's articulate, and he's just a real hardworking brother with all kind of integrity. He says, I said, how old are you, man? He said, I'm 32. Are you married? No. He says, I just dedicated my life to the struggle. And I said, well, I got some sisters I'm going to bring over there for you, man. All y'all sisters say you can't find a good black man. You can go and import one. And they got a bunch of them over there in the Dallas Del Del Panthers. They had a demonstration, and there were 5,000 people. 5,000 people. They marched through the city with their fists in the air and a big sign. And I got, they got me holding the sign up front. And the sign says, uh, I don't know what the sign says. But they were saying, black, we must be, I'm sure it was good. It was positive. They saying, we salute, no, what they say? Black is proud, black is strong. We salute the blacks alone. And then sometimes they would just say, black salutes, black salutes, black salutes. All hail were Noka Rashidi. It was very flattering. You get to the place, and they introduce me, and they're speaking a language called Malayalam. In the north is Hindi. In the central portion of the country is Marathi, and in the south is Malayalam, none of which I know three words of, all together. So they had to translate it, and I started off by saying, and this is a text uh, produced in a knowledge broker. I hope you get a chance to get one. And I said, uh, Jabim, that means black salutes. That's their version of hotel. I bring you greetings from the black people of America. And they went off. <laughs> they love us. They admire us. They think that we are trailblazers and forerunners of revolutionary struggle. It is nice to be in a place where people think so highly of you when most of us don't even think that highly of us in America. These people are familiar with Malcolm. They don't know much about Martin Luther King, although Martin Luther King went to India in February 1959. <laughs> they know about Bobby Newton, Bobby Newton, Bobby Seal, Huey Newton. They know about Mike Tyson. In the north, there was a newspaper with a picture of Mike Tyson. I said, well, you guys got Iron Mike in there, because he's one of us. Yeah. So I got up and spoke, and I did this thing. And every time I would say something about black people, about Africans and adults being one people, they would just light up. Very enthusiastic. In other words, brothers and sisters, I stumbled on, on the land ancestors led me to a place where they have a black consciousness movement that's rapidly expanding into an African consciousness movement. I literally expected to see Stephen Biko walk out of the shadow any time. And I'm right in the middle of it. In this city, Trivandrum, 
of a million people, the Dallas do not own one business establishment. They don't own anything. But the Carolina Dollar Panthers have put all their resources together and they've rented a building for six months. And it's their headquarters. So I uh, inaugurated it and I did a speech there. And then that evening I spoke in a YMCA. And there were about 150 people from all over the community, the whole spectrum. And we had what in the United States might be called a town hall meeting. And we talked about our common situations. So that was wonderful. Next day, winding down, but this is important. This doesn't happen every day, so I want to give you at least a highlight. Um, went to the birthplace of a person named Ian Colley. Ian Colley was one of the greatest leaders the Dallas had, too. He built a school. And then went north to a place called Cochin, also in the state of Kerala. Kerala is the only state in India, perhaps in the world, with a freely elected communist government. It's a Marxist government. But they're just as racist as the other Hindus. And the Dalit Panthers and the, um, the communists, they, they go at it all the time. And they're like struggling for the supremacy of the city. So I was taken north by the Kerala Dalit Panthers, and I met with a group of Dalit Christians. Now these people were lying to me, they schemed, they told me they would cover all my expenses, and I could have said they don't know anything about it. No, let them have it. You don't want to get ripped off. I don't care what you call it. You know, people lying, doing all that kind of stuff. So I go there, and the next morning, I was taken to another tribal area. And this is one of the highlights on the trip. This is literally in the rainforest, or the jungle. Hundreds of kilometers into the jungle. And I'm saying most of the time, man, we are going too far. I don't want to get stuck out here. I don't see how this car is going to get over these roads. That's a river we have to cross. Let's turn around. And they would just ignore me. And finally we get to a, this area, and I see this little bitty black lady with blonde hair, and this little bitty brother, looked like he come just out of Australia, and they looking at me funny, and I'm looking at them funny. <laughs> and then finally we drive a little further, and there's another little black lady with blonde hair, and she's walking with a staff in her hand. And she's smiling and grinning and making all these gestures towards me. So I asked the translators, what is she saying? And we don't know exactly what she's saying, but she's obviously very glad to see you. So I was taken from hut to hut. We had to, <coughs> excuse me, we had to go get permission of the village elder to visit the area. And we did. And all the time, this little old lady is following us up this mountain. Literally, thick forest. These people lived on the products of the forest. Bamboo, tapioca, coconut, honey, and a couple other items. But gradually, little by little, everybody stopped doing what, stopped what they were doing and started following me around. And I you know, took pictures with these people. I took a picture of one couple. And I ain't a very tall brother. I wish I could lose some weight. I'm a very tall brother. And these people stood about this high. Wow. Yeah, and little bitty black people. And uh, so I go from hut to hut, and, and they all offer me stuff to eat. By this time, I've gotten used to drinking the tea. <coughs> I just don't look at it. <coughs> I say, give it to me, and I let it cool off, and then down. <laughs> I wasn't going to be rude. I don't care what. I wasn't going to reinforce these notions of untouchability that I'm better than you, that I can't sit with my brothers and sisters. I came here to be with you. So I did all that. And finally, somebody gave me a large cup of raw honey. They said, try it. And this time, I did look at it. There were ants and bugs in there. Oh, and I said, well, maybe I'll just take a sip. Okay? And, I it back. and finally, we walked away again, and a group of, of people followed me. We walked by one guy cutting bamboo. He says, I want you to stay a week, and I will take you all over the mountain. I said, brother, I would like to come, but uh, you know, I have a family in the United States, so I'm about ready to go back. He said, well, go then, but come back. And I asked him, I said, how often do you all have visitors from the outside? Never. Nobody ever comes here. And sometimes people try to come, but they get discouraged and go back. So by this time, they're taking coconuts, cutting coconuts from trees, and they like us now. They see this guy must be all right. We don't know where he's from, but he seems cool. And they tap a hole in and put a straw in there and give you a coconut, and you just drink the coconut milk. A bunch of bees started following me around, and I was ready to go by that time. And by this time, after an hour, this little old lady with the staff, 
has finally caught up with me. She's just smiling and grinning and making all these signs. And I says, man, uh, I asked her what her name is, and she told me her name, long name. I couldn't remember it if, I, if you paid me. And um, I said, well, what is she saying? <clears throat> and they said, man, she's just delighted to see you. <laughs> it's a little black lady. She says, um, in the best translation, she says, I know that you are not from here, <laughs> and that you must be from someplace far, far away. But I feel that you are a part of me, Wonder. and I'll never forget you. Wonder. That was one of the highlights of the trip. Yeah. I still get a little misty eye when I think about that. Yeah. Finally, in coaching, the Dollar Christians and the Carolina Dollar Panthers are ready to come to blows over me. They are competing with each other. They both plan programs for with me at the same time. So you know it's going to be a disaster to begin with. They're cursing at each other. They're hollering. And I said, well, man, I don't want to be in any of the programs. I said, what you do is combine the programs into one. So they said, OK. Program's supposed to start at 8.30. It starts quarter to 10. I got an 11.30 AM flight, if I can get the ticket. And then the guy who introduced me, Ambu Jackson, Spoke for 45 minutes. <laughs> I thought it was Alton Maddox, man. <laughs> Alton Maddox is an attorney in New York that when you come to his place, he introduces you and he speaks longer than you do. An introduction. And I'm just sitting there like, come on, man. Be cool. When are you going to stop? And he literally gave my speech. He said basically everything else. I, I was really mad. And it's hot again, no air conditioning. And I said, well, brothers and sisters, it's my pleasure to be here in coaching. I've never been here before. You know, I want to salute you for your efforts. And since my speech, and now that Uncle Jackson has basically been already given, do you have any questions? And nobody said anything for about a minute. I said, OK. I want to thank you very much. And I packed my tape recorder and my camera and, my, and got them and walked out. And they were just stunned. They followed me out of the building. They followed me to the airport. They waited in the heat, on the asphalt, in the, on the pavement, for me to give one more speech. Yeah, I was touched. And I tried to give them the most inspirational speech I'd ever given. And they all waved at me goodbye. Very touching. Finally, back to Delhi, where I started. And uh, uh, once again, nobody's there to meet me at the airport. But a brother shows up late. His name is Pramod Kuril. Pramod Kuril. And he insists <clears throat> that I don't stay in a hotel. Now, I want to stay in a hotel by this time. Because <laughs> I've, I've stayed in 11 places in 21 days. I stayed in the Salvation Army Youth Hostel, an American Youth Hostel, three different hotels. I slept on the train. I stayed in people's houses. When I got back to San Antonio, for the first few days, I would wake up and I didn't know where I was, <laughs> in my own house, in my own bed. So this guy says, well, Brother Renoco, it won't work. Because a lot of times, tourists who come over here by themselves, they are robbed in these hotels. So I want you to come stay with my family. More lizards, the whole nine all over again. <laughs> but Pramod really looked after me, wouldn't let me spend any money. So for every person I met who tried to rip me off, I would meet a person who, who was a prince or princess, who just bend over backward to be kind to me. And that means so much in a situation like that. So I met with a person who will probably be the first Dalit prime minister of India. Did some shopping in New Delhi, in Old Delhi, went to the National Museum, met another journalist, and finally got out of there. On um, March 21st, I mean, April 21st, by that time, I'm wearing Indian clothes. I'm thinking of myself as a Dalit. I've got an attitude. I despise all the members of the upper caste, and they sent me through changes at the airport. They searched all my luggage, and they looked at my passport. They saw my outfit. And they saw I'd been to Egypt a couple times in the last year. What were you doing in Egypt? I said, I went there to see the pyramids. You know anybody over there? No. And by this time, I've got an attitude. I'm calling people idiots, and I'm frequently using the F word. Because <laughs> I'm getting ready to get out of there. So I figured I would get it all out of my system. And well, they got the gist of it, believe me. So that's my trip. Now I'm going back next year. I'm not going back to all of those places, though. <laughs> Some of those places I'm going to bypass. My trip was largely a political tour. The tour will be an educational tour of the African presence in India. That will include the Bodhi Tree, tribal areas, Taj Mahal, 
the temple called Ellora, time on the most beautiful beaches in India, meeting with the Kerala Dollar Panthers. The trip's gonna cost about $3,500. It'll be 18 days. I mean, the first African-centered tour of India in history. And I would like for you to be a part of that. So for those of you who are interested, uh, Sister Jaquetta, in addition to the magazines, the books, and the tastes, and I hope you will purchase some because a lot of those proceeds will be going towards the school and also in the Kerala Dalit Panther Center in Trivandrum, I want to build a library because they love African American literature. They weren't crazy of rhythm of the drum. They were almost fighting to get rhythm of the drum. I brought 10, and they were upset when I didn't have enough for to go around. They're very interested in African American resistance literature. So I want to build, and I pledge myself to build a library in the center called the Kwame Ture Pan-African Library. Kwame Ture is formerly Stokely Carmichael. And unfortunately, when he's battling, looks like a losing battle against prostate cancer. I'm told he will not last the end of the year. I hope that's wrong. But before he becomes an ancestor, I want to have that library established in his name. Oh, hmm? wonderful. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. They exploded nuclear devices, too. I was over there between the national elections in India and the detonation of, of, of these bombs. And I came right in the middle. I don't know if I had anything to do with it or what. <laughs> these are the Himalaya Mountains. This is China. <clears throat> this is Burma. This is the country now known as Myanmar, right here. Is that sharp? Can you see that pretty clear? Yeah. I guess so. Well, let's see. <laughs> this is Brother Astenu's projector. Astenu is a long associate of mine and a good brother. And every time I come here, he allows me to use this equipment, so I'm grateful. This is a collective effort. requires all of us. And I must say, I was very impressed by the amount of money that was uh, raised tonight. And I think it's wonderful. You know, give yourself a round of applause. And that's all right. When you do those kinds of things, it makes you think we can win. <clears throat> okay, I got a half hour. Go through this. 5,000 years of history. Flew here into Delhi, up here. And then you can see Patna right here. Patna. And uh, this is the Ganges River. The Ganges River runs right through the city of Patna. And then uh, I took the train. Uh, I came down here. This is uh, near Calcutta. That's where Bulgaria is. I took a train all the way from here, all the way over here. I'll never do that again. And then I went to the caves over here, the temple, and then I went back over here by car, and then I flew down here. This is where Trivandrum is, and finally I flew back to Delhi and out of here. Now, this is a historical overview with slides. These people represent the first people in India, little bitty black folk. Some of my most distant ancestors, right there, black people in India. I doubt if they're four foot ten. But they look healthy and vibrant. And they have a happiness as a couple that I wish we could achieve over here. So you're right. They seem delighted. Strong black man and a beautiful black woman. I love it. Okay, and this is a sister from that same area and a little baby. And just as a variation for that and a continuation of it, <clears throat> I have this one right here. So it's kind of functional, too. <laughs> I don't just think the wrong thing now. See there, give you a bitch and y'all gonna run. I ain't gonna do that. <laughs> now, you see the size of the people? Yeah. Tarzan, King Kong, Jungle Jim, Bomber the Jungle Boy. Any of those movies, you can find this fellow right here. And these people seem, they don't seem the least bit happy okay. about being with him, especially his sister right here. Right. I know they want to cook him for dinner. <laughs> well, maybe they don't. Uh, this is from the Indus Valley, and this is just one of the ancient cities that have been excavated. At some point in time, I'm going to go there. And that, I may go there again by myself. This is in Pakistan, and that's a one-day trip. Uh, this is just an example of the writing system that was used. You can see it over the Zebu bull. And the way this is done, this is not natural. They take something when the, from the time that the animal is very young, and they tie it around its back, and they shape it like that. 
and their descendants are still all over India. You can see the writing system. And these are cylinder seals. These were used to stamp private property. Oh, we have an excellent crowd tonight, too. Good. Makes me feel glad to be back in L.A. And don't be too terribly surprised if Brother Noko doesn't come back here in another few months, because San Antonio is a different vibe altogether. Uh, again, the writing system. A man in the yoga posture is 5,000 years old. This is a piece I actually saw the artifact in the National Museum. I've been look, sh looking at this slide for, <coughs> wow, what happened? for 18 years. Yeah, come on, brother, please. You're going to have to get yourself a chair, though, and come sit with the sisters. Or <coughs> you can take this chair right here. How you doing, black man? <laughs> Okay, now we're going to have to go quick, brother. Just focus it. And you might even lower it a little tiny bit. Come on, quickly. And I will also be at Christ Unity Center tomorrow. I think that's at 5.30 or 6. Sunday. Thanks. Sunday. The 14th. All right, lower it a little bit. Let's roll, quickly. All right, good. Now focus. Okay, now this is a quintessential African woman, seems to me. And that's probably a little stereotypical, but that hand on her hip and that posture, that's a soul sister for sure. And you can find them anywhere in the world. And you also find women with all these bangles. That's very common in India. And these are all from the Indus Valley. Focus it, bro. There we go. I saw this piece. This is called a priest king. They don't know what he is. Just like their sister's called a dancing girl, and she might have been the queen of the whole country. But she's called a dancing girl, yeah, because people see things through their eyes. That's why this is called looking at India through African eyes. From our perspective, through the eyes of Brother Renoko Rashid, the ambassador. Okay, now, his eyes, his eyes are semi-closed, and um, I guess he's meditating. His nose is knocked off. Now, what does that remind you of? Okay. And I actually saw that, that artifact in the National Museum. These bones were found in that city, and these are the remains of black people who fought against the Indo-Europeans when they invaded the country. All right. Yeah. This is a tribal area. Remember I told you went to the tribal area? I told you went into the jungle? Now, I didn't go anywhere quite like that. I'm close to it. And you can see that this is relatively inaccessible. It's very hard to get to. And they don't have a lot of visitors. And I went into places like that. This is uh, what happens is after the Indo-Europeans come into the country, there's a resistance movement. What year was that that they fought? From about 1500 BC until today. But that major battle in the north is from about 1500 BC to about 500 BC. And then around 500 BC, the blacks begin to come back to power again in the north. And they are in power in the north for about 700 years. And then those Hindus, those white people, they assumed power. And then the Muslims came into the country, and they dominated India for a few hundred years. They didn't care about the black untouchables. All they wanted to do was maintain their own power, and then they had the British. The British are seen by the untouchables as enlightened invaders. And the untouchables don't have any problem with the British. They see the Indo-European descendants, the Brahmins, as their real enemies. Now, this is a resistance leader. And this is a depiction of the Lord Krishna. Krishna. And this is on the cover of my book, The African Presence in Early Asia. And there's still some copies I saw at Esso a few days ago. And unfortunately, it's about to go into its fourth printing. I'm very pleased about that. And um, this is supposed to be an incarnation of a deity living large, kicking back, chilling. <laughs> Uh, this is one of the temples I did not go to, but this will be on the tour. This is a place called Ellara. And uh, you see how big it is. You see the little people down there? And it's carved from the top down. It's carved, you stand on top of a mountain and you start digging. And after about 25 years, this is what you get. This is very similar in many ways to an obelisk or a mill, but it doesn't have the top. So we're going there on the trip. I've never been there myself, so I'm excited about that. You'll also see the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal has been described as poetry and marble, and it was built for a black woman. All right. 
So it should be nice. It will be. Okay, this is just another temple complex in the south. This was on the trip. I photographed that. Right on the other side is the ocean. It's very hot, but nevertheless, you find very few people bathing. For some reason, Indians, when I've seen, aren't keen about getting into the ocean. I don't know why it is. I'm not saying they're not clean or anything. Another cave complex in the same area, this is in the state of Tamunadu. And I remember running into either this one or that one. And that wasn't the best idea, because I was so happy to see it, I dropped everything and just took off running to get in there. Only to find that it was inhabited by mosquitoes, flies, and bats. So I ran faster out of coming out than I did coming in. This is a god of wealth. This is actually at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. This is a representative from what's called the Kushan Dynasty, and again, you can purchase one of these and get everything on the same slides right here. And there are just a few of these left. And the books and the tapes and stuff. Uh, and again, most of the money go to India. Look at the nose knocked off here. And this is from a dynasty called the Kushan Dynasty. K-U-S-H-A-N. Kushan. And it reminds you of Kemet. And this, therefore, are, is a king from Kemet. And he is Agnani's daddy. This is Amenhotep III. Nose is gone too. And he's important in this context because a Christian writer, a man named Eusebius, wrote about the third century AD that in the reign of Amenophis, or Amenhotep III, Amenophis is a Greek rendering, in the reign of Amenop Amenhotep III, a large body of Ethiopians, we got some Ethiopians in the house tonight, and unfortunately you hear about the conflict between Eritrea and Ethiopia heating up. That's the tragedy in the making. Um, in the reign of Amenophis III, a large body of Ethiopians. Ethiopian just means black people. The term Ethiopia in ancient times is not the Ethiopia of today. The word Ethiopia was a broad land encompassing both Africa and Asia. And the people in uh, Asian Ethiopia had straight hair, and the people in African Ethiopia had uh, tiny curled hair. Brother, if you just, if it's real brief, real quick. You spoke with Ethiopia. Yeah. We have to deal with that at another time. Thank you, brother. Anyway, you have Ethiopians in both Africa and Asia. And uh, so a body of Asiatic Ethiopians apparently during his time, it's around 1400 BC settled in the valley of the Nile. This is Asar, by another tradition, Asar, or Osiris. Remember, I have the thing of Osiris, just to, you know, be on the safe side, over there. And uh, he's supposed, this is a god king from Africa, civilized Africa, brought humanity to Africa, or civilization, and then he left Africa and went into Asia. And he civilized everybody over there. And he didn't bring an army, he took two of his companions, his nephew, and a flute. All right. And he, by his deeds, by his role modelship, you know, brought civilization this part of the world. African people went all over the world. That's right. But unlike the white man, they didn't go there and kill everybody, slaughter everybody, enslave everybody, change the name of the joint and say we discovered it. Right. Africans, generally speaking, brought bearing gifts. And that's why they were well received and considered gods and goddesses. I saw as an example of that. This is the Ganges River. There's another tradition introduced by J.A. Rogers in particular, as supposedly documented in a book around 1600 by a man named Samuel Purchase, a British fellow, that an African king named Ganges went to northern India and conquered it in ancient times and named the river after him. That's a tradition. Somebody said, a guy named Godfrey Higgins wrote a book called Anacalypse, he said, I found something black whenever I approach the origins of nations and religions. Wow. And I pretty much believe that's the case. Okay. And this is a depiction of the Buddha in India. Now, the early depictions, all, almost all of the depictions of the Buddha, even modern uh, depictions, tend to have him with tightly curled hair, peppercorn hair, kinky hair, woolly hair. Uh, but he is even more Africoid as you go farther east, and you see how the blacks expanded into Southeast Asia. This is another one from India. I wonder if I could get my foot like that. I never noticed that before. Seriously. Now, this is from the temple. 
climbed up the mountain, fell, broke my watch, <laughs> swarms of bees, electricity went out, but I got in there and took some pictures. I wasn't going to let anything defeat me. All right. And you see, look at the people in there. That's why I took that train 28 hours to come there. That's right. This is another depiction. This is, look. <laughs> now, there's one argument that the Buddha was an Egyptian or, or, or an Egyptian priest. They do have a different type of hair texture than most black people in India have. So, and this is off there. Folks, it broke. Now, this is really sharp. In fact, I have to tend to think that this has been actively restored. Because that just looks too brilliant. And fine. Yes, we better not go there. This is a, a Buddha from Sri Lanka. Look at the lips on it. Michael Jordan type. This is from Thailand. And these are from Vietnam. You know, now, Southeast Asia is called Indochina, and it's called that because of the confluence of the cultures of India and China. We call it Indochina, and you have a strong Indian influence there. So these are from Vietnam, and these are these reflect black people from India going over there to colonize the place in ancient times. Again, and again. Look at the nose on him. Okay. Is that a nose or is that a nose? That's a Vander Holyfield nose. <laughs> this is one of the Hopshis. Remember, I was called a Hopshi? Uh -huh. This is a Hopshi. And his name is Malik Ambar. Bad brother. And again, this is where we've come from. Now, what we're going to do is spend the next few moments as we wind down. And I regret we have to rush, but you know, I've got to deal with constraints of time. We're going to be in the south. We're going to be in the south and South Central India. And these are most of the tribal peoples. So I'm just going to go through these quickly. A lot of you have seen these, but some of you have not. So anyway, here we go. If you see anybody you know, shout. <laughs> shout it out. Wow. Make sure it's sharp. Great. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, is that a brother or a sister? What do you think? Brother. Think so? Yeah, I, I think it is a brother. I just left Oakland, San Francisco. Um, now, this is a black man from South Arabia. And I just put him in there in, in context to show how widespread this physical type is. Back to India. Yeah, I know. Yeah, down the street. Crenshaw, any given time. And uh, even got that nose ring. Uh, he could also be from Australia. This is the kind of people I've met in Northeast India. That's a brother. No, it's a brother. Uh, I can tell you that. Man, come on, man. Lift it up, man. Cater boy with chipped teeth. See, I knew that because I knew the caption on the bottom of the picture. That's the only reason I can say for sure. One thing I'll say, he just looked black. He looks African. Now, we can argue over the gender, but he's definitely a black person. Now, I don't know if that's a brother or sister. <laughs> Oh, no doubt about that. Some of it, we don't even have to discuss it. This is a serious looking sister right here. You need to get her up in a good life next time Jamal, you raise money and get her to come to the mic. These are very interesting. Now, these are the kind of people I was meeting. They were clothed a little bit more, but basically these are the same type of people. Unfortunately, most of the slides I have are pictures from India. I have not had a chance to have converted into slides. So that would be a good excuse to get invited back to the good life, maybe in late summer or early fall. Is that your mom? No, she's got something wrapped around it. Oh, okay. Now this slide, this is a very interesting slide. Yeah. A friend of mine insisted that I give to him because it looked just like his wife and child. This is Sakya Sai Baba. He's regarded in some circles as a holy man or a god man. That's what they call him, a god man. 
But in other parts of it, he's regarded as a fake and a fraud and a charlatan. He's a magician. And the dollars can't stand it. He looks like the dollar? Yeah. And this is one of my earliest slides. I got this when I was at UCLA. And this is what led me on this odyssey of discovery in the sense of dealing with the black president and looking for at photographs like this. Now, you can't get any more African than that. And this is from South Central India. And on the tour, you get an opportunity to go to one of these tribal areas. Uh-uh, so many different, she's younger. There it is. Again, you can't get that. We're assuming I'll, I'll autograph it. She's a bride. I don't know how she is. I would imagine she's about 15. I heard estimates she's anywhere from 10 to 20. I say she's about 15. I'd say about 8 or 20. Come on, there it's 8. Come on. What is in, what is in the, those bottles? Um, this is a sister from South Central India, and she looks very much like a Maasai. From Kenya. Yes, ma'am. The last sister that you showed, she looked very much like uh, the Turkana. Her? Before this one, no. Back a few. Oh, I know what you're talking about. She looked like Turkana from Kenya, the tribe Turkana. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Uh, this is probably going to make Jamal mad. Let me show you one more. That her, her. Her? No, the one. Her. her. She looked like a Turkana. Okay. Well, there's one person who looks even more like that. I'm trying to find it. Her. You don't think so? Yes. I believe that. Yeah, definitely. And again, it shows the range of African people. I always like to say we range of complexion from snow to crow. Show. <laughs> I'm winding down tomorrow. Five more minutes, man. All right. You say that like you don't believe me, man. <laughs> All right. You see the little sister again? Yeah. And the, the, the bangles represent wealth. Oh, yes. And there is, that's a better picture of Sati Sai Baba, right? <laughs> I didn't meet it. No. Maybe another time. <laughs> is he black or what? You think so? You think he's black? <laughs> and that's the classic one. <laughs> the brother that I saw going in the Domino's Pizza as I pulled in. <laughs> One of the large, thick crust pizza. <laughs> yeah, strawberry soda. Got to have that. Red soda. And this is an interesting looking brother. Yes. He represents that. Black man is the original man on the planet. Find us everywhere, including China. And this is from the cover. Of the, this in the book. This is Gandhi, Sergeant Major M.K. Gandhi. Okay, the man Martin Luther King loved and idolized. And he was a, a, a vicious killer of dollars. He supported the suppression of dollars. And you see he's in a South African military uniform. So why, therefore, is he credited with being an apostle of nonviolence? He fought in two wars to seize the land from black people. Wow. There he is in one of these. He's here somewhere. And this just described it. Gandhi Mill Road recruited an ambulance corps of over 1,000 Indians as part of the British Army during the Boer War in 1899. There he is again. Now that's clearly Gandhi. This is a medal he won fighting against black people. And here, this, I guess, is typical of you know, how some people perceive him. The, uh, most of the dollars look at Gandhi like a Jew would look at Adolf Hitler. All together different than most of us do. Including Gandhi as a monster. Killing of 20 villagers in Bihar. I went to Bihar. That's what I encountered. Bodies piled on a trailer. I was out in that field. Wow. The private army of landlords targeted women and children, and the manner in which the crime was committed was particularly gruesome. You don't want to know the details. Oh, and that's the kind of stuff I saw. This is a statue of Dr. B.R.M. McCarthy, the great national leader of the Dalits. The headquarters of the Maharashtra Dalit Panthers, named after the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. This is yours truly on my first trip. 
They got changed very much. And this is Mr. V.T. Rashekar. I'm interviewing him in a hotel in Hyderabad, El no, Presidente Hotel. And this is us now, a few months ago. We both a little older, a lot more gray. Here's that very handsome fellow in the middle with the aunts, Renoko Rashidi. This is Mr. V.T. Rashekar. And this is the cabinet minister I referred you to when we're in his office. And I tell you, that really was saving to me when he gave me that packet that got me out of that hotel, because I wasn't going to pay that $600. <laughs> yeah. Now, last but not least, this is just two or three, three slides left tomorrow. We're out of here. And after they buy some stuff. This is Mr. Shilla Dungey Houston. Got to praise our ancestors, right. even our recent ancestors, because she's the first person, not the first black person, the first person to write comprehensively about black people in India. And she happens to be a sister. And that work was published in a volume called Wonderful Ethiopians in the Ancient Kushite Empire. It was published in 1926. You should get a copy of it. In Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, black woman, Priscilla Dungy House, and tough sister. And these are three of the men in my life. Uh, this is John G. Jackson, who I knew personally. And uh, I would sit and talk to. We talk about India. We talk about everything. He's a remarkable man. And um, he's an ancestor now. And also an ancestor is Dr. Chancellor James Williams. I never met Chancellor Williams, but I talked to him over the telephone. We corresponded a little bit. And he's the author, of course, of Destruction of Black Civilizations. And my current favorite, Mrs. is the great John Henry Clark. Now, I did a presentation, and, and the tape is over here, too. Just a little audio tape. In New York City, before I went to India for the ASCAT conference, and they gave me a plenary session. They gave me an hour and a half at City College in New York at 1 o'clock on the opening day of the conference, prime time, the joint was packed. And I, held, I felt I was at my best. I did a presentation on great African historians, profiles of, of character. And uh, I dedicated my remarks to Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark. Now, Dr. Ben was in Egypt at the time. And I'm pretty close to Dr. Ben, too. I saw him a couple weeks ago in New York. He's lost a lot of weight. And, uh, and I said, where's Dr. Clark? Nobody knew. Well, I dedicated my remarks to them anyway. So halfway during the presentation, somebody handed me a note and they said, Dr. Clark is in the audience and he wants to come on stage. So I said, okay, everybody, we're going to stop. John Henry Clark's going to come on stage. And they wheeled him up, Lynn Jeffries, in a wheelchair. And I did this presentation and Dr. Clark sat right behind me. That whole presentation. And after it was over, he left. He never came back to the conference. I thought, hey. I was honored. That was a big deal. Dr. Clark always encouraged me. I said, man, well, some of these people don't seem to perceive themselves as Africans. He said, don't worry about it. He said, when Africa becomes strong, there's going to be a whole lot of people you've been identifying as Africans. He said, don't worry. Just keep on doing your work. So he's 84 now. And last, I always end my slide presentation with this. I don't care what slide presentation is, what the subject matter is, with this little bitty black girl. Ain't she? From Gambia in West Africa. I don't know her name. A friend of mine was in Gambia. She took a picture. This little girl was begging. And she took the picture from right outside the bus window. It came out remarkably clear. She gave me a, a print, and I cropped it, and I had to convert it into a slide. Now, what is that little girl looking at us and saying? She's saying, black people, what y'all gonna do? No. She's saying, you got all this information. You got Jamal, you got Renoko, you got Kedia, Stainu, Jaquetta, all these folks talking that talk, editing magazines. Now we got all this information, what are we gonna do with it? It's not enough to leave it in the good life. I want you to leave here tonight with a new sense of mission and duty and purpose. That's how I came back many of this time. My first trip, I was depressed for six months. Wow. But this time, I came back fired up. Because there is a new African in India that is standing up and demanding his rightful place in the world. Hotel, right. brothers and sisters. Okay.